and welcome back to the Nota Girl Podcast, Season 2, Episode 3. I'm your host, Dr. Ivan Khan, and today we will be talking about the latest in education news, growth, and culture. We're going to try a new format of the show today. Uh, we're going to be having me fly solo. We usually have a guest, and we have a lot of uh, exciting guests lined up for the next few weeks. But I do want to keep us all up to speed with education news as it happens. And this week, we got some big, big key uh, announcements and uh, updates coming out of Washington. So for all of you who've been watching season two so far, thank you so much. We are also really, really uh, grateful to our team and our sponsors here. Kishendra, how's it going for you? I'm all good, man. Uh, how are you doing? Today um, was a bit sunnier than usual. Always like that. The weather report coming through. It's uh, beginning of March. We are coming in like lions and leaving like lambs, as they say. The Detroit Lions coming in in March for the off season. Uh, but today we're going to be talking about you know the education updates this week. We have uh, a lot of activity out of Washington, D.C., the Supreme Court, uh, hearing testimony from both sides around uh, student loan forgiveness. President Biden has had this plan that's, um, you know, a lot of folks are happy about it. A lot of folks are still griping that it's not enough. So we'll, we'll, we'll take it back. You know, last summer, President Biden and his administration found the magic number of $10,000 for student federal debt forgiveness for federal student loans and anywhere up to 20000 for those who also received the Pell Grant while enrolled in college. As you know, Pell Grants are for those with higher uh, financial needs. And this is, we're talking about $10,000, $20,000 for, for, one, for one individual. It adds up. There are millions and millions of Americans uh, in the country um, with college student loan debt. And there's a lot of money at stake. At the same time, with the pandemic happening, a lot of folks, uh, you know, weren't able to work fully or had disruptions were laid off. So, you know, let's take it back to this past Tuesday. We got two reports here, one from CNBC, shout out to Annie Nova, and one uh, from The Hill, shout outs to Alex Gan Gangitano. And it's always wild to me that whenever it's media, they're always going to in the news based on the narrative of the ownership of the media. So CNBC, the liberal outtake, the headline, Biden administration lawyer may have saved student loan forgiveness plan at Supreme Court. Uh, experts have predicted the Supreme Court would rule against President Joe Biden's student loan forgiveness plan, but some changed their minds. Some of these experts changed their minds after the oral arguments and praising the lawyer who presented the administration's case. And that is Solicitor General Elizabeth Prelogar. And they were astounded by the preparation, poise, and power that were quite impressive. So, you know, the testimony happened throughout the week. And uh, we have quotes as, she may have snatched victory from the jaws of defeat. And, you know, we're, we're going back and forth. Clearly, liberals want to see this past. Uh, those who are, um, you know, in line with President Biden's plan, conservatives who would like to see President Biden fail, would like to see this fail. They, they don't want to see this pass because they don't want to see anything that makes, you know, the other side look good. And, and both sides are can be guilty of that at, at any given time. But we're talking about 10 grand for a family, uh, for an individual, up to 20 grand if, uh, if they're from, you know, uh, struggling backgrounds. So when the Biden administration rolled out its student loan forgiveness plan in August, it cited the HEROES Act of 2003 as its legal justification. And the, they had the right to waive or modify student loan programs to ensure borrowers aren't left worse off because of a national emergency. And opponents on the conservative side say that canceling hundreds of billion dollars in debt and student uh, debt for tens of millions of Americans goes far beyond the scope of the HEROES Act. Uh, clearly, a lot of conservatives, uh, they're, they're saying, hey, we're talking about half a trillion dollars and 43 million Americans, Clarence Thomas said. How does that fit under the normal understanding of modifying? So both sides are going to go back and forth. Um, will this be enough to sway the Supreme Court the way it's constructed right now? Let's hear what the conservative side has to say. The Hill, 
from by this Wednesday that said Biden says he's not confident. Uh oh, President Biden's not confident that his own plan is going to pass the Supreme Court. Um, he's like, hey, I'm confident we're on the right side of the law, but I'm not confident about the outcome of the decision yet, said President Biden. So, Kashendra, thoughts on that? You're a student. We got a lot of students, and uh, I mean, my father-in-law is still paying off student loan debt. I think NEPA was dealing with student don't debt, student loan debt up until just two years ago. Thoughts on this as we prepared for the show today? Uh, I might have a little bit of a unique take because I'm a student, but yeah. I was lucky or unlucky, depending on how you look at it, that I didn't need to take out student loans. I paid out of pocket for my entire tuition, for my entire four years at university. I will say, though, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, Ivan, at the beginning, like this, we're going all the way back to the 2020 election when something similar like this was proposed. <clears throat> uh, wasn't it student loan forgiveness up to whatever the amount was? You know, exactly. So, yeah. so like, it's almost like the ceiling has dropped a little it, bit. Of course it has. Of course yeah. it has. It's, it's going back and forth, dude. I mean, at first it was like, we're going we're gonna to cancel it. You know, all a lot of, of folks, it, right? oh, we're going to yeah. cancel all of it. And then when the other side came about, they're like, no, 50K, 50,000 is, is the magic number we have mm -hmm. to stay underneath. So, you know, everything goes back and forth, back and forth. And, you know, we're not there in those backroom deals for them to come up with these magic numbers of 10,000 and 20,000. Yeah. Whatever it is, they did the math, and, and again, it just, it just kept coming down. It's like the back and forth happens, and this is the result of it. So a lot of folks do, you know, accuse politics of being more about the perspective, and how how does this appear? Not how much this will help us. So we're, you know, no matter what side of this argument you stand on, if you're a, a an American trying to pay off your student loans. We really, really hope this passes. We don't want to see you have to be on the hook for these student loans forever. That's my personal opinion on it. How long were you on the hook for your student loans? Student loans for undergrad were not that bad. For medical school, because yeah. I, I, had a, I had a chance to go to the CUNY system, um, which was really, really helpful. For medical school, it was at least several years. Yeah. So, um, you know, I was working during medical school. I was starting off cons Brooklyn. Yeah. So I was able to help pay for some of those bills along the way. But it's not easy because you always have that uh, the fear of the principal amount and the compounded interest. And it keeps adding and adding and yeah. it never goes away. And before we move on, how exactly does the uh, up to 10,000 debt forgiveness work? Do they just give you a lump sum or what, what do they do? As far as that, um, the, because this is debt that you're paying back to the government, it looks like that's just going to be wiped out. So if your bill from the federal uh, loan per portion of it is 35K and you're you know either getting 10 or 20K, the amount that you pay will be just be deducted. So Got that's you. what it seems like. No one's you know walking home with checks. They just have <laughs> lesser of a bill on the other side. But hopefully we'll be able to find out by next week how this goes down. And with that, you know we'll talk a little bit about the college admissions trends in the growth section. We, we're still in the education section. And we have to talk about grade level proficiency, one of my favorite topics for parents to find out about. So right now, we got to find about a grade level proficiency. Grade level proficiency is abysmal. Right now, more than 50% of New York City students are below grade level proficiency standards. And when we look into the case for underrepresented minorities, that is even tougher, where in many, many places, only one out of four kids from underrepresented communities are reading or performing uh, or doing their math at grade level. So as a father of two kids, uh, thank gosh, I got a fifth grader at home and I got a second grader at home. I'm having these conversations every single week, um, checking out. And luckily, I go to a school. My, my, my kids, my children go to a school. Um, in the suburbs where they're constantly being uh, given standardized exams or just assessments, uh, the MAP assessment, the NIWAs, the state exams. And we're really having a great chance to see how well their academic progress is. Academically, thank thankfully, uh, at home, you know, we've been able to support my children. But sadly, that's not the case for New York City. So prior to the pandemic, as many of you know, we had 1.1 million students in the New York City school system. Since the pandemic, that number has uh, decreased by around 150,000 
he might be in the high 800,000s or, you know, the low 900,000s for total student enrollment at, uh, you know, New York City's school districts. And it's really just one big giant school district. We got the five boroughs. You got the map over here by each school district. And I'm from Queens. I had a chance to go to District 24 as a kid uh, in Elmhurst. Shout out, shout outs uh, to all of our friends at Elmhurst. And then from there, we were able to take our talents out to South Ozone Park. So by then, by uh, second, third grade, I was out in District 27. So we had some good times out there. But as I, you know, went uh, further and further along my academics, I saw that the resources were not the same. As my family's economic situation became slightly better, you know, inching along, I started seeing how like any new school I went to had way, way better resources. So a lot of it came down to funding. And the problem is that funding is full, still fully, fully not there, uh, depending on where you live and depending on political uh, funding from, you know, uh, that there's a $22 billion uh, fair education fund from from uh, the state that was owed back to the city. And, and look at the devastating effects, you know. Kashendra, what neighborhood did you grow up in? And we'll go right to those and we'll, 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 we'll go for a little tour around New York City. Where are you at? I grew up in Jamaica, Queens, Jamaica, New York. Jamaica. So you're from Jamaica, Queens. That puts you right around District, what, 28? It, was, it, was, it is 20 something. I, don't 20, know I think you're at 28. Now. 27 yeah. is also our good friends at Ozone Park. So, right now, you'll see that it's, it's, it varies by a lot. It varies by racial group and it varies by what school district you're at. Like, take a look at 26, the north part of Queens, where we have close to 70% of students in one particular group um, reaching grade level proficiency. And you compare that with, let's take a look at District 27, you know, South Queens, and you, you take a look at the red bar and you, you see 20%. So for kids in the same grade, you got 20% of kids in, you know, one neighborhood reading and doing math at, the, at a particular uh, grade level. And then the next neighborhood for a, a, a different minority group, we have 70%. So it's like, how can we work to make sure it's starting to even out? And when you're there and you check it out in the Bronx, it's even more dire. We got, you know, we've had two locations uh, in the sponsor company at Constitutorial. So I had a chance, a lot of time in the Bronx. I went to Bronx Science myself. But as you know, uh, the Bronx has oft oftentimes been forgotten by those with the funding dollars. And we have, you know, rates as low as 11% in District 12. 11% of one particular minority group are, are able to do reading and math at grade level. So we want to change that. And we believe there are way, way better ways to change that than some of the ways that have been proposed. And we want to, like, discuss, you know, the twofold solution of you know, everything around improving K through eight education. And today we really want to talk about K through eight education. Um, and there's been a lot of town halls around anything from class sizes to expanding G and T to implementing culturally responsive education and to ensuring there's enough resources for those with IEPs. My personal, personally, my children, uh, they're both have 504 plans, one for their ADHD, another one for ASD and uh, accompanying uh, you know, conditions. So the class sizes bill uh, has had uh, some success in passing through some legislation. And the class size bill wants to make sure there's less than 25 kids in each class. And personally, I have mixed feelings about that. While I'm happy to see class sizes decrease, you want to make I want my other side of things is that I, you want to make sure it's done in a way where kids in the same level are in the same groups. I've heard about ways that you want to take the, the, the highest performing kid 
put them in the same exact class as the as, as the lowest performing kid. And through, you know, osmosis or just, you know, being sitting next to someone, they're going to naturally have that knowledge transfer. I don't see that happening based on my experiences in the classrooms for nearly three decades. And uh, I wouldn't advise parents to count on that. So, you know, right now there are anywhere from 28 to 32 kids in a lot of schools in New York City. Maybe the numbers have it at 26 to 30, but we know that at some schools that is spilling over. Um, staffing has been a huge uh, <clears throat> challenge throughout the pandemic. So we want to be sure that, you know, schools have enough teachers for the number of classes they have. And there's also a GNT bill out. Um, can you check out the GNT bill? Please check out Senator Joseph Adabo, Kashandra. Let's Google that up while we're. So there's a GNT bill out right now. And that GNT bill wants to make sure that's being expanded and more and more folks are taking advantage of having those opportunities in their, in their, uh, in, in every single school. So when I, growing up in South Ozon Park in Elmhurst, I had a chance to go to some of these GNT programs back in the day because it existed in every school. I did not have to travel to a different location. I didn't have to take a 15 minute subway ride as a seventh grader. So, you know, there's a lot that we want to do. Uh, there's an attack on uh, seventh grade algebra. You know, there are a lot of folks that don't want to see algebra given too early. And there are a lot of parents who want to make sure that algebra is offered as early as a seventh or eighth grade. So by the time they graduate from high school, they've completed AP calculus. So these are a lot of common sense um, requests that a lot of parents have after speaking to countless parents, uh, nearly all of them want that option. Even if, even if they know they don't have, um, even if they know that, that their child isn't interested in algebra, oftentimes parents still want that option. So as far as improving the conditions of K through eight learning in New York City, you know, the state exams are coming up. We want to make sure that more and more families are keeping up with their preparation where we hate to see students, you know, lag and fall behind. And, you know, before we you know, move on to the growth section, this is before the pandemic learning loss. So before the pandemic learning loss, we were already at only, you know, 25 to 40 percent of kids being proficient. And now with the pandemic learning loss, it's even gotten lower. Yeah, so, it's, it's, it's a really, uh, uh, I'm trying to find a synonym here. You used a great word earlier, dire situation. Um, I don't want to use <clears throat> something too scary, but uh, it, is, it is scary. We're already at 50%, and it's only gotten worse since uh, 2020, which is unfortunate. I, I did get a chance to look at Joseph P. Adabo here, the yeah. New York State Senator, the legislation. What's going he, on there? Uh, he wants to... Uh, expand uh, the advanced and GMT programs and classes to create a pathway for the top students to develop throughout their time in elementary and intermediate schools. Now, going so from expanding GMT from K through eight mm -hmm. in all schools. What and else? It, it would also allow students to be admitted to advanced classes even at the elementary school level through academic merit. So through basically a meritocracy, which is a whole other conversation within the public school system that can be had. Uh, going from top to bottom with a couple of things uh, that you mentioned, though, if you could go mm -hmm, back mm -hmm. up in the slide. Oh, I think it might have been the other one, but it was with uh, funding when you were talking about, it's, it's, it's a little bit of a cycle, right? Mm -hmm. these, uh, these students are suffering, and they're, they're not getting to the levels they should be getting to because their schools are underfunded. But the schools are underfunded because they're not getting to those uh those benchmark scores right so it's it's just one big cycle one vicious cycle into, leading to the other way. exactly so it's it's something man but you know one of the things i've, I've noticed though when yeah. i when i took a look when i take a look at queens and even though there are uh some problems in queens you know we've we've been in the game for about 28 years so if you if you point out the areas where we have students in certain neighborhoods, those neighborhoods happen to be outperforming the other school districts. So it's like a quick shout out to our sponsors for helping boost grade level proficiency. Um, so I love to see that. 
uh, and with that, we'll quickly go over to the Opportunity Scholarship that we've been ho uh, holding down at Constitutorial. Uh, during the week when I'm not having all this fun on the podcast, uh, as the CEO at Constitutorial, we've had this Opportunity Scholarship. So we want to remove barriers for families to get absolute access, a whole year of, of tutoring access and prep for a seat at the specialized high schools. Right now, due to you know systemic problems like the pipeline and and a lot of politics, a, a lot of the there's these kids aren't getting served. A lot of our kids are not getting served, and we want to make sure we have these prep classes uh, for free for them, and we're going to be paying for it all at cons. Uh, so you know, last week we had a chance to talk about Dream Chasers. Uh, we spent the whole week. Applications are still open for the Opportunity Scholarship. You just need to be a seventh grader. Uh, you got to have at least an 85 GPA in math and English overall. And we're going to invite all the applicants to our four locations on March 18th. Take the diagnostics. Uh, you know, we want to make sure students complete the program, apply to a specialized high school, and really use uh, education as a way to get, you know, out of uh some of the economic conditions and some of the other conditions we've all had to grow up with as first generation um, citizens in the city and, and kids in our families. And uh, for anyone who's, who's uh, gone through the immigrant experience uh, as a first generation immigrant or an underrepresented minority, we absolutely encourage all of you to apply and um, deadlines on March 10th. So, you know, don't sleep on it. And, and, and we can't wait to see your application. So, so two question about it. Uh, it's been around since, was it 2014? Or That's was... right. 2014, we're in our, um, yeah. you know, it's been nine years, but we had to, we couldn't continue it during COVID. So we had to take a three-year break. Mm -hmm. It's finally back and we can't wait to see it expand. How many, how many students would you say you guys managed to help within the, the nine-year period? Well, it had Be to be hundreds, right? Between our Opportunity Scholarship that where we cover the whole cost and our work with Dream Chasers where, uh, you know, their donors support it or our work with Brooklyn Tech directly as the official prep partners, the Brooklyn Tech STEM pipeline program. We've had about 200 in about five cohorts, five to six cohorts. So excited uh, to see what happens now. And we're doing a lot more, Mr. Yeah. Kashendra. You got the you got the whole video shorts going. I do. I do so indeed. with we that, we got those one there. minute shorts. Yeah, well, you, you got to get the word out there because um, not a lot of people even, you know, they don't even know about the existence of these things. So you, it's informing them of the existence of it is probably like even the most important step so that you have as many of these talented students applying as possible. Uh, do you guys know how many recipients there would be this year yet? Or? Uh, right now, we're th we have 10 full scholarships. We have four locations. That means we have 10 seats. Uh, four in Jackson Heights, two in New York City, two in Jamaica, two at Ozone Park. And of course, uh, depending on the scores, we're going to be exploring how we can expand the number of partial scholarships. So even if it's not for the entire 10-month uh, program that we have left, hopefully it'll capture uh, at least two to three months uh, for partial scholarship winners. Nice, nice. So y'all know where to apply. And that should be a good segue for a uh, word from our sponsors. And we'll be right back with the growth section. Knowledge, encouragement, and community. That's our promise at Khan's tutorial. The Dr. Mansoor Khan SHSAT scholarship was created in 2014 to boost diversity at New York City's esteemed specialized high schools. Right now, less than 50% of New Yorkers are grade level proficient in ELA and math. This can be due to underfunding, neglect, and political infighting. We believe there's a solution where both merit and equity can coexist. Since the start of our tutoring scholarships, we've improved the pipeline of standouts from an early age. Since 2014, our scholarships and partnerships have helped over 200 Black and Latin students gain acceptances. It is our mission to expand our scholarship program and work with schools and community leaders to increase awareness, provide high quality prep, and ultimately mobilize underrepresented communities. Contact Consultorial to apply today. Best wishes to you all. And we're back to the Notre Girl Podcast, Season 2, Episode 3. We're covering all the updates this week, it's beginning of March 2023, finished up our education section, now we're moving into our growth section. 
spoke a little bit about college admissions already. Right now, we've seen a lot of changes since the start of the pandemic, since we've recovered from the pandemic. Starting off, undergraduate enrollment across the country is down, anywhere up to 15, 18%. That means colleges are exploring ways to boost the number of uh, applications they have. Uh, you know, mid tier colleges, colleges that are struggling, and top colleges that usually get lots of applicants are finding new ways to increase the number of applications to those elite institutions. So, what does that mean? First of all, we have more and more people applying to college for these coveted seats, and that is driving the acceptance rates down. So we have more people jockeying for in, in certain areas for less seats. That means it's tougher and tougher to get in, and that's not always good. <laughs> And with that, we're seeing a lot of new phenomena and new trends for these uh, mid-tier places and elite places. So I'll go through a list of an amazing article uh, in this blog post by collegedata.com. Shout out to College Data. First and foremost, we'll make this quick. Application volume and competition remain high. We know that there are um, Boston University's admissions rate dropped from 18 to 14%. Because more and more people are applying to Boston University. Could that be uh, due to changes in admissions requirements? Very possible. Furthermore, uh, as acceptance rates dip lower, even the most qualified candidates cannot be guaranteed an offer of admission. It's another way of elite universities trying to sound more elite, if you ask me. We've had so many. We've never had such an amazing, comprehensive applicant pool. We're sorry, you can't get in. So that's that's how most of these rejection letters read. Trust me, from someone who's read a lot of rejection letters. Number two, at some colleges, early decision is becoming the new regular decision. Orange is the new black. What's going on? At some colleges, early decision is becoming the new regular decision. So that means you know, if you're if you got your heart set on UPenn, for example, I always like to use UPenn as the example because. The early decision admissions rate is at least 16% or 14%, where most of the other Ivy League universities or selective universities are have application uh, rates somewhere between 5 to 7%. So with that said, uh, UPenn, um, you want to be able to use that. Before the pandemic, colleges admitted no more than 20 to 30% of their freshman class through their early admission rounds, but this is changing. At Barnard College, 62% are getting admitted through early admission. Uh, so that's uh, shout outs to those who are using the early decision rounds to secure their students because it is indeed a match for the other side too. So as other colleges seek that, they're trying to decrease um, uncertainty. They're trying to keep their yield, their yield rate high. So the more kids they get in who say yes back to them, that makes them look better. So that's just another reason why they're doing that. Next up, they're also offering um, additional early decision rounds. It looks like this entire regular decision pool has been so cumbersome and so annoying for not just the applicants, but for administrators and admissions committees on the education side as well. Yeah, um, even this is, we're talking 2017, 2018. Yeah. Around the time I was applying to college as a senior at Brooklyn Tech, even then, it was like, um, I don't know if you ever heard the saying, it's from The Incredibles, the Pixar movie, where the villain said, if everybody is super, then no one is super. And even then, it was like, everybody was doing all the decision. And in my head, you know, this makes a lot of sense. Because I'm like, if everybody's doing all the decision. Then that doesn't sound too equitable. No that doesn't decision. sound equitable from the Pixar side. Uh-oh, yeah. what do we do? <laughs> Uh, if everyone's getting it, no one's yeah, special. Exactly. That's what it's like. If everybody's doing early decision, then I agree with that point. Like it is the new regular decision. Give us a lot to chew on. We we got to we got to put that we got to put that uh, we we got to take a deeper dive into that movie next time. That sounds like a lot of gems in there. Oh, it's it's an amazing movie. Yeah. We also have uh, number four uncertainty about submitting uh, test scores. Uh, that's becoming uh, a, quite the question we've been getting. Who really benefits from the optional, test optional? 
people that may benefit are the colleges because more and more kids will start applying to that college even without that SAT score. So that college will start making a lot of money and uh, from all these extra additional uh, applicants. That college is not increasing the number of seats for admission. That means their acceptance rate is looking just that much more competitive. Who else benefits? Let's say mommy and daddy have been paying millions of dollars or tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands in donation dollars through legacy. And youngster, generation two, junior, they don't have the requirements to get into mommy and daddy's college, but they've been paying a lot of money. So what are we going to do? We're going to remove the score requirement so we can get them into the school. So unless you fit one of these, um, oftentimes schools will be using your score if there's a decision point. There's going to be 20,000 applicants for 2,000 seats. And that's just a run-of-the-mill 10% uh, admissions rate school. And you got to keep in mind that a lot of people will be submitting uh, their scores. So if, if you're a great test taker, absolutely go for it. Have your boosted scores and submit it. And now we got number five. We have more and more colleges accepting video submissions. As you, as you know, the application can be um, not just what's written, but get a full, hey, I'm going to send them this podcast when, my, when, when the kids apply to college in my house. It's like, hey, I'm going to have you on the podcast, and uh, I'm going to have their, a whole episode dedicated to just their <laughs> college application. I'm going to send that episode to the admissions committees and say, hey, to get, get, them, to know them. To get them to know them well, know to grow, right? And finally, majors go under the microscope. Students also want to think twice about listing a less popular major on their application with the hope of transferring departments later. Um, if, you want to, if you wouldn't be admitted to a major as a first-year applicant, it's extremely unlikely to be admitted as a transfer. So none of that. Hey, I'm going to get into their this school, and then I'm going to really go into their uh, most important, uh, like th their more widely known major. So finally, overall, focusing your personal college fit is more important than ever. There's so many options when you have colleges and you never want to just, you know, a pigeonhole yourself into something that you, you're you not into. Next up, uh, moving on to the next topic, a little bit of, a little bit of a mental health check in today. Um, you know, we've been seeing in the country that more and more adults are starting to proactively seek out mental health therapy. It's becoming more and more a part of the daily conversation. Um, Hats off to the younger uh, millennials and Gen Z. Um, what I've noticed as an older millennial, uh, it's a lot more widely acceptable speaking about mental health conditions, your wiring, uh, whatever have you um, nowadays than it was, you know, 20, 30 years ago. So with that, you know, popular culture has also um, made seeking therapy a uh, much more uh, acceptable form. So now up to 20% of adults are receiving mental health treatment. Over up to 10% of children are receiving men mental health treatment. There's far greater understanding that we have uh, as a society for things like uh, developmental conditions, whether it's ADHD, learning needs and disabilities, autism spectrum disorder, sensory processing, processing disorder, and of course, you know, all of those can grow with that individual into adulthood. And, um, you know, that that's, doesn't far from more commonly adult uh, grown, grown up conditions such as anxiety and depression. So mental health services, we're big, big fans of that here um, at the Notagro podcast, the growth section. You'll often find our dedication to mental health services. So. Kishendra, you ever hang with the boys and one of your one one of the fellas says something really off key and you're like, yo, man, my man's need some help for real. Oh, if he yeah, if he don't. deconstructed this stupid freaking remark, he would have realized how much of an idiot he sounds like. So are you a fan to see more of your guy friends getting mental health treatment? Um, yeah, but I wouldn't even I feel like the phrasing because you said it earlier, yeah, the younger generation Gen Z. It's not even a thing where it's like a taboo yeah. at all. Um, and we every time we speak, we always have a check-in of like, yo, 
how was your day man how did it go like we that's the first thing we do because it's like the most important thing for everybody's uh everybody's psyche uh, before we get into anything else we we always have that check in popular culture wise you know it's not only in movies but it's also in sports it's and also in as the music. great yeah. marshawn lynch said protect your chicken protect your mentals protect your health protect your chicken it was chicken uh like slang for your money your bag i you know what's so funny i tried to actually look that up and i was like that is probably only a marshawn lynch slang that's, that's a marshawn that's lynch not slang. a location slang. my <laughs> gosh so you know uh hats shouts out to marshawn lynch for uh you know uh, tackling that uh, check on your mentals and hats off to demar Derozan and kevin love and the nba for paul george paul he george too, which is and this is a separate conversation related to it, but for as much as people say uh, that they're all in support of it, as we all saw when Paul George was going through it during the pandemic in the bubble, there was also a lot of people mocking him. Oh, of course. That's that. So, that's how media comes in. Media's trash, bro. Like They'll be like, oh my gosh, we need to get this guy help. And the second... When, when he was doing... Ter- and he was doing like terribly because he was going through he's, something mental. and he's like, being he mocked and, he, and if you're being mocked incessantly by the media who's trash like people like skip bayless uh who's always trying to like screw around um you know it's it's really unfortunate you know when public figures they're asked to do a lot and lead by a lot and when they do they still get clowned on mm-hmm. uh so hats off to everyone you know fighting through that your own mental health journeys we're gonna be speaking about that a lot Seek um, the proper help that you need. Speak to your guidance counselor and make sure that you are, you know, putting yourself first and self-care is important. So we'll be back, um, you know, with that uh, word from our sponsors and we'll hit up the culture section next. We believe that every child should have the highest quality education at the lowest prices. Cons Tutorial is back with in-person and live digital classes for students in grades three through 12. Our programs help thousands succeed through small class sizes, top diagnostics, and free parent workshops. Join us for specialized high schools, SAT, state exams, summer programs, regions, and college admissions. With 30 years of experience and incredible results, families trust cons as your number one tutorial. Call us now for your free trial class. Welcome back to the Notre Girl Podcast, season two, episode three. Yeah, we don't have a title for this episode yet, do we? Work we got a, is it like a March update? Episode three? The next episode? We got to figure that out back at the drawing, like at the editing room. Are we going to keep this part of the, are we going to edit this part too? So let's get into the culture section, which is going to be, we're going to be starting off with Women's History Month of March. Uh, shout outs to... Uh, the celebration of International Women's History Month, March. International Women's Day uh, is coming up uh, this month. And from the United Nations to organizations around the world, we'll be celebrating uh, the important role that uh, women in leadership and uh, women's history plays in the betterment of society. Um, Small shout out to uh, one of the main women in my life, my mom, we had uh, March 2nd was Mrs. Khan's birthday. We called, and, you know, we had, we had Mrs. Khan's birthday. Oh, we got the signal. We have the signal over here. So we're going to have some fun. Um, but it, it's, been, it's been crazy. It's been, um, you know, a few years ago, we were able to attend many conferences in the United Nations. And we were able to really gain a deep understanding of some of the work that's uh, not only being done to advance, um, you know, the women's rights across the world, but also the amount of work left to continue that. So to everyone that is in this uh, space um, and working so diligently towards um, women's rights, the gender pay gap um, to improve Improving uh, maternity leave rates um, in the in the developed world. There's a lot of progress that has to be made, and it's not just in the developing world. In, I mean, even in like you know developed nations, where in the United States we don't have uh, 
paid maternity family leave uh, the way many, many other countries do. Uh, so those are you know, topics that will be at the forefront of discussion. And of course, uh, personally, I'm just thinking about all the conversation that's been happening around this country around uh, women's reproductive rights and women's right, a uh, woman's right to choose, and how much you know we support that. So we just wanted to give big, give a big shout out to everyone in this movement towards equality, towards the empowerment, um, uh, and celebration of International Women's History Month, and you know just want to give our entire blessings and you know celebrate that. And and while there is still. Uh, a while to go and obstacles to overcome. It's also a month to to remember and celebrate what has been accomplished and the many great women out there. You know, we always um, and this is not at all to discredit them, but we always celebrate and hear about you know the Rosa Parks of the world, the the Susan Anthony's of the world. I got an interesting question for you, Ivy. Mm-hmm. Who is a woman in history that's probably not that well known by, I guess, the Western world or America that you know of? Maybe somebody. In BD's history, or somebody, you of know, course. Some other history, because I got one in mind that I would definitely bring up right now. You, you know, know, I got I got a lot of strong first. women in my family. I yeah. gotta say, from my grandma to my aunts, um, to you know, they're all in leadership in administration and education. So if I have to put my Mount Rushmore, it starts at home mm-hmm. uh, with my amazing, incredible wife Nipa and my mom, my Kalas, uh, my nani. And of course, all my aunts and my father's side, um, you know, and, and I have been doing a lot of reading uh, by folks like Sheryl Sandberg and some great uh, friends who are uh, leading some incredible organizations. But I do want to hear uh, your special shout out. My special shout out has to go. So I'm, I'm from Guyana. Yeah. It is a Caribbean nation. It's also a South American nation. It is to Miss Janet Jagan. She was the fourth president of Guyana, uh, first woman president, uh, as I guess it's implied. And she was also the wife of the third president. Um, so right after he mm. passed away, uh, she was the one that took up the mantle. And she was also a freedom fighter in Guyana. You know what's the crazy part is? She's not from Guyana. She's from Chicago. She was a Jewish woman in Chicago that Chetty, the third president, met while he was you know, out here, you know, I guess, finding himself and also doing freedom fighter things and wow. he met her in chicago they both went back she they obviously got married they lived there he helped fight for the country's freedom from the british empire and what and what year was this would you mind telling me or well, having it uh, if you if you don't have it off the top of your head look we can i look don't it have up. it off the top of my head but um I mean, guyana is a very young country so it's not like it was you know tons of years ago yeah she, she was the president in the 90s she okay she, so this is this is recently as as, as the nineties, huh? She's as recently as the nineties. She and only passed away, I think, in the early two thousands. Well, God bless her career, her work, her contributions to the history of Guyana. And what's her name again? Janet Jagan. So Janet, everybody knows how to spell that. Jagan, J A G A A N. Janet Jagan. Yeah. Special Women's History Month celebration shout out. Towards the next topic. We're going to move away, move over towards hospitality. I've been doing a lot of reading on hospitality, my friend. I got two books completed. I recognize and that blue one. What's up? I recognize that blue one. Which one? Uh, setting the Table. So we'll, we'll, we'll go from the first one, Setting the Table by Danny Meyer. Transforming the transforming power of hospitality in business. Danny Myers, the founder of the Union Square Hospitality Group. Mm. And of course, I was also able to make some time for Unreasonable Hospitality by a mentee of Danny Myers, <laughs> Will Guidara. So these are two awesome books I read, dude, mm-hmm. on, on hospitality. And Which one did you read first? I had to read the Danny Meyer one first because it did happen first. And, you know, to boil it down, he really talks about something called enlightened hospitality. And I'm not Danny Meyer, so I can't take credit for it. Mm -hmm. I'm just a podcast. I was talking about it on my podcast. So it's like enlightened hospitality. It's like a cycle. You put the top five people in order. And whenever you're running an organization, you put each other first. You put your teammates first. 
And then we put our guests first because we can't put our guests before our teammates. Mm -hmm. And then when, once that happens, it spreads to the community, put the community first. And then our suppliers, those who we work with, our vendors, our WB Masons, mm -hmm. our landlords, our uh, the people office we have to solutions. pay all those bills to, huh? The office solutions. The people, office yeah. solutions people. Um, and then we got our investors, uh, you know, whether they're owners or investors into the company, but they come last. And whenever you put your products before your profits, you put your sales last. So again, you're putting your teammates first. Service happens to you. Hospitality happens for you. Good service will only get you so far. Hospitality, the quality that makes customers feel good and want to come back, is what really counts. Enlightened hospitality means prioritizing your stakeholders and treat everyone like a VIP. So he goes into it, and you know, there's, and he also speaks about uh, the six critical relational skills. Um, you know. And, and just like this all happens in the context of his amazing life, creating the Union Square Hospitality Group. And did you know where your favorite or my favorite burger comes from? You know, you know, you know, Danny Meyer founded my favorite burger, too, right? Uh, is it not at the Union Square Cafe or is it somewhere? Else? Oh, uh, close. It's not at the Union Square Cafe. It's a stone's throw from our office in Flatiron with uh, Shake Shack. The first really? Shake Shack was in Madison Square Park. And Danny Meyer created the Shake Shack burger because he wanted to invent the perfect burger. Wait, so he made, so he created the Shake Shack burger. Is, does he have any like stake in Shake Shack? Currently? Well, he's, he created the entire burger. He yeah. created the company. So the company really? Shake Shack yeah. was started as a project because he was really trying to invest and celebrate like the great American burger. Mm -hmm. So they go into he go in the, in the book he goes into you know the decisions that went into what type of ground beef they're going to be using, what type of tomato they're going to be using. Uh, you I, say I tomato, we say tomato. I didn't know he created Shake Shack. He That's created the damn burger and the gosh darn and, food, and, the, uh, and he they're using a potato bun. They're oh, using they their the secret food, sauce, right? which yeah we got we got to get Shake Shack for lunch now. Oh, we're getting so hungry, and the, he talks about the crinkle cut fries. Because they're able to hold the sauces when you yes. dip it. Yes, that's so true. So he he went through it all. He grew up in St. Louis, and this is Danny Meyer. Um, so I gotta give shout outs to um, also his hiring philosophy. His hiring philosophy is a big shout out. Fifty one percent for hospitality, forty nine percent for technical skills. This led to the follow up, uh, you know, book by his mentee uh, Will Gidara, who's um, led a lot of Danny Meyer restaurants, such as uh, 11 Madison's Park, which has been rated the number one restaurant in the world. Um, and he's been uh, the general manager at some ter terrific, fantastic hotels. So again, culture of hospitality is something we're trying to bring everywhere we go. We want to be sure that we're always ready to over-deliver, under-promise, over-deliver, and hospitality doesn't have to be in food or just having someone at your home. It really means in every business. So we're really hoping to, you know, and it's carry, be sincere more than anything. Carry that philosophy. What's up? It's got to be sincere more than anything. Oh, that's true. It has to be coming from the heart. It yeah. can't be just staged, and bro. As, as someone that's been to the Union Square Cafe when you uh, took me there when the first time we ever went out to Flatiron. Yeah. Like, it is very sincere. I'm, it, I love the way that they run that place. It was a good day. Yeah. It was a good day. We had some great conversations and. It worked out because the day that it happened, Donovan Mitchell was not traded to the Knicks. Mm. He was traded to the Cavaliers. Yeah, but today, but we're talking what? about the Knicks' seven-game win streak nah, nah, nah. to wrap up this uh, amazing episode of the Notre Grove culture, uh, uh, that, the culture section. Yvonne, if we're going to mention Donovan Mitchell, we got to mention the man who the media refuses to give his due credit, Mr. Jalen Brunson. <laughs> Who's been playing like an absolute superstar? Do you see the points he's putting up, Ivy? You see the stats he's putting up, and he's no putting really up. Grinds my gears. It's definitely grinds my gears, and he's putting it up with the efficiency of a big man. That's the crazy part. That's it. With the efficiency of a big man, I don't see anybody talking about this man being a top ten point guard, even top five. Well, guess what? He's playing like it. 
So who was the Eastern Conference Player of the Month for February? I don't know. Was uh, it? Let's look it up. Was oh, it? You. It was Jalen Brunson, folks. It was Jalen Brunson. It was All nine right. and two February, everyone. Yeah. So good. we got it. So basically, the NBA screwed up. NBA, y'all screwed up. Y'all had uh, a rising All Star who's 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 just right there. He's dishing and swishing and dishing. And he's he's the number one scorer since 2023 started. He's been like top three in scoring. He's the number one scorer, uh, like a top three scorer in clutch situations. He has led his team to a, an amazing turnaround record um, and on a seven game win streak. Right. So the NBA screws up and they don't select this guy as an all star. You know, there were there were a few all stars that made it. Everyone deserved it. However, Jalen Brunson deserved it more. Yeah. And then when you screw it up like that so royally, what he what does he do? He puts his him and his mate, him and his mate Josh Hart, Josh the Hitman Hart, comes over, and they got a seven game win streak. Josh Hart is undefeated as a Nick so far. Right? He's undefeated as a Nick. He he, he tied the record for a seven zero record, ties it for the best record since a midseason trade. Mm -hmm. And tonight, uh, we're gonna try to make it eight against the Miami Heat. By the time you're listening to this, we don't know what the when whether it's gonna be snapped down in Miami and South Beach or not. But um, Brunson has given us twenty four four and six this season. Just rounding up and rounding down a couple of numbers. Uh, and the reason I'm doing that is because he deserves to be rounded up and rounded down. Yo, like, time out. Yeah. Brunson is averaging 24 points for the season so far. Yeah. As a point guard, 6'2 point guards, 24 points, and four rebounds, and six assists. Past, let me count this. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Just in the past 12 games, he's had a 40-point game, a 39-point game, a 38-point game, a 30-point game, a 28-point game. He's been going off. So basically, media, y'all screwed up. The NBA, y'all screwed up. When when we signed Jalen Brunson, we had yeah, we have him on a nice we had him on a too. nice deal, and everyone's like, "Oh, Nick's overpaid. Nick's gonna Nick." They they struck out on Donovan Mitchell. So motherfuckers like Stephen A. Smith, shut the up. What is like Skip Bayless? A. Shut the oh, up. Get me started on that. Fake we fan, man. are good. We have a great point. We got a point guard, and now we have a terrific. Glue guy, we got to resign quickly. We got to resign Josh Hart. And then by the time uh, that poison pill stipulation is done on RJ Barrett's contract, we'll see how the playoffs yeah, goes. We'll see. And we'll see what the next uh, big superstar trade will be. Pascal Siakam, I'm not speaking out to you directly at all. OG Ananobi, it's not like we could use a terrific wing who could guard all positions on the floor and slash. I'm not. I'm not. I'm not writing love the letters Knicks, to y'all yet. The Knicks but... are the fifth seed in the East right now. We're 37 and 27. I think we're sitting really nice. We're sitting, we're sitting nice, really nice, but you know we want to sit pretty as well. So let's go to that. Let's get the home court advantage. And to all of our fans and listeners, thank you so much if you've been listening up until this point. We wanted to try a new format of the show where we're just talking about the latest updates we got. Um, you know, our guest producers, our regular producer, our guest host, Mr. Kush. Thank you so much once again for being such an amazing uh, part of this discussion for course, education, growth, for and me. culture. Wishing you all a fantastic March. Let's get it. Let's get that bag. Take care of your mentals. Take care of your chicken. And always remember to pay it forward.